Hello everyone uh, from all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is the sixth session of uh, the Talking with Titans. We started uh, at the peak of this pandemic when everyone was staying at home and trying to have connect with each other. So this we started in June and today is the sixth session and then last session of the year. Happy New Year before to everyone. Uh, so uh, today our guest is Dr. Earl Victor Shuresh. Uh, so this, this event uh, is organized by, as we said, Aquaculture Nutrition Network, uh, jointly with uh, Jeffo Nutrition Inc. And as well as today our guest, Dr. Victor Shuresh, and we have uh, Dr. Albert Tekken from Aquaculture Nutrition Network and Ms. Pum Jai from Jeffo in the background. So as we know, Aquaculture Nutrition, Nutrition Network started in 2011, and today we have about 3,000 members worldwide. Uh, and uh, the mission was having a nonprofit platform uh, for industry uh, people, as well as nutritionist formulators, uh, the, our trade people, business owners who are, who, are in, who, who are interested in aquaculture, feed and nutrition, and feeding as well. Uh, and this platform grew to, I think, in the last six months with this uh, event, we almost doubled our membership. So this is an amazing success for all of us. And hopefully we can continue to deliver, uh, you know, uh, good programs uh, to, to deliver the, the updated information uh, on aquaculture, aquaculture nutrition, uh, the global status and future, you know, uh, where we are going, where we want to go. Uh, coming to uh, Jeffo, Jeffo is a, is a global leader of, uh, in non-medicated food additives established in 1982. So almost, almost 38, 38 years old, started by Mr. John Fontaine, uh, I would say a visionary agrologist coming out of school, uh, tried to help the uh, farmers around him, and that's how we started. So the vision of Aquatic Nutritionist Network is to help the end users, small and medium and large, and build the industry together, uh, which, which with, with Jeffo's help, we started this event, and hopefully we can continue in future. Uh, so uh, coming to Dr. 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 Shuresh, uh, I think he has a similar uh, a journey similar to me, like bachelor by bachelor from India, Tamil Nadu University, then then masters. We are from the same institution from Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, and uh, he came to US for PhD uh, in Southern uh, from Southern Illinois University, and uh, I think it was a kind kind of a kind of mere consequence, right? Our last speaker was also from Southern Illinois University, uh, Dr. JC Atushnitsky. Uh, in professional life, he is managing director of United Research based in Singapore. Uh, he was director of nutrition of an international research organization. He was also uh, an editor, and I used to read that magazine, right? Formulation and Beyond. Uh, I don't know what happened to it. We, can, we, will, we will hear about that, right? When we, we, when we chat. Uh, also some commercial experience. Last but not least, kindly he holds the uh, position of uh, I think he's the president of uh, Society of Aquaculture Professionals, right? Uh, it's, a, it's an uh, India-based organization. And uh, today's topic is formulation of product development. It's important because what we have seen the last uh, few months during the COVID, the raw material price is increasing, right? Feed price is increasing and uh, farmers are suffering because farm gate price is not high. This is a big, big problem, especially in Southeast Asia and South Asian region. Uh, I think in, in, in Latin America region as well. So uh, I think I'm, I have talked a lot, but I will ask Dr. Shuresh to talk something about himself and, and his journey, uh, journey until today, right? What he is doing, we are almost like third quarter or fourth quarter, third quarter, I would say, I would hope third quarter of our life, right? So uh, where are we and where we want to see and uh, how we came to this point? Dr. Victor Shuresh. Third quarter of life. Never, I never thought of, you know, uh, in, in those lines <laughs> to be in the third quarter of life. But anyway, uh, 
Uh, thank you, Kabir. I think uh, this uh, uh, thing that you have done, I think it's a great thing. You know, the um, uh, the the nutrition network, AAN, uh, I think that's a fantastic idea. And, and you know, put, put the steam into it and, and I'm very grateful to you as well as your organization. Uh, that is supporting you in in doing this uh, this important thing. Uh, you know, in in this age, uh, we need uh, a network like that. So, uh, and and you have organized a great series of uh, presentations. And I, I feel you know uh, the people who have spoken to uh, uh, you know in this uh, in this series before me are all true titans. You know, I'm I'm just not you know a, a, a nutritionist. I'm more a you know, somebody who worked in the on the industry side and and learned uh, almost all of it. Um, you know, work, uh, from from my through my experience. So uh, anyway, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak in this, and I'm very happy to see Albert uh, after many years. Uh, you know, um, Albert and I were involved in early stages of my career. You know, in my or that second quarter of my career uh, is where we were involved. And it's, it's good to see that. I, mean, um, I also happen to know PJ from uh, the past also, you know, we have been professionally involved, uh, you know, at, at that point of time. So uh, it's good to see you guys and who isn't there. I don't know who else is attending this meeting to everyone, you know, wherever you are, you know, like you said, uh, good morning, good afternoon, you know, good evening. Um, greetings to everyone. Um, uh, about me, uh, yeah, like just I said, um, I, uh, you know, after I finished my PhD in, in Southern Illinois University, uh, my PhD topic was not on a, a core nutrition area. Uh, I was more interested in the growth biology of fish, and, and that's my background. And uh, and then I entered into, uh, you know, we just. Yeah, I finished the school in, in Illinois, just crossed the river, uh, across to Missouri to start working uh, for Ralston Purina, uh, which then became sort of my university for nutrition, uh, education and nutrition. Uh, was uh, uh, Ralston Purina at that time was the uh, top in, in pet food, but they had originally started in, in uh, animal feed and livestock feed. And they're also pioneers in the aquaculture feed. And uh, so, you know, when I started, I started my internship under uh, Dr. Joe Chamberlain. He was again one of the great uh, practical nutritionists that I, uh, you know, that I know. And uh, when, you know, uh, on job, I, I learned a lot of things. And and, and then uh, a few years later, you know, we had some personal reasons to go back to my home country. Came back to India, and then I was a consultant. And in fact, the business that I worked for was bought by Cargill. And uh, then Cargill wanted me to be a consultant. And also, uh, you know, I started my consulting program with Bentoli, a feed additive uh, manufacturer. And uh, so it was, it was sort of fun, you know, to be independent in Asia, in, in the home country and do it. And then I sort of took, you know, I, I can call it a, a, a sabbatical in a way. Um, uh, when Joe Chamberlain again, you know, he he had this program in in Brunei uh, in domesticating uh, black tiger shrimp, and I wanted to go back to you know hands-on research and and but we also had a good consulting program, um, had uh, clients you know that ranged from Mexico to China, uh, and then you know we built a program further, working a lot in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, particularly in Indonesia. Um, and uh, that sort of um, uh, that program, you know, involved you know hands-on research for about uh, four years, uh, where we developed diets for uh, monodon, tested a lot of different things in very controlled settings. You know, that I did not have previous uh, experience in doing that. So um, again, it was a very good uh, learning experience. So uh, then, when that project ended, uh, I, I moved to Singapore to form my own company. Uh, Singapore largely because it's uh, very convenient in terms of international travel, working with the clients and all of that, you know, it was, it was very convenient. So, so I decided to go and, you know, do that uh, in, in Singapore and it's been you know, almost, a, almost a decade now and uh, uh, been, you know, this, this is a very interesting uh, uh, field, you know, aquaculture, nutrition and feed 
uh, really uh, professionally very fulfilling for me. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm here um, in, in this field and I hope, you know, I can spend another decade now, uh, in, in, in this third quarter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Suresh. Uh, I think the true Titan, we have only one true Titan here, uh, which is Dr. <laughs> Taken, right? Uh, <laughs> We are. We are the. I'm the kind of follower for both of, of both of you, but I will ask uh, Dr. Taken. I'm going to say something. You know, like uh, what is feeling the journey that we are taking together. I think, and and, and your your journey as well. We know, but this event, talking with Titans, right? You were closely involved. Started with you. Even the Nutritionist Network started with you. If you think, like I asked, like. Do you like to would you like to join and so what do you think the initiatives and why we need to have this right your opinion I, do, yeah. I mean my my two cents was it's just that we're really fortunate to have victor here that in in the end what we wanted is to create a forum which is tailored to the needs of of industry you know and so what victor is is great about is that you know we all have an academic background but his focus is always on on working with feed companies, R&D, you know, and, and that's the perspective that we need. Most of the speakers that we've had are people from industry. And at the end of the day, you know, our job is to serve the farmer. If the farmer fails, we sell no feed. And those good feed companies are those that, that, that look at the, you know, that look at the farmer's needs and then tries to do their R&D to focus on that. And so I'm, I'm happy as hell that we have Victor here, um, and um, you know I'm learning every day. And I think we all, you know, we are we should all be open to to learn new things and new ideas. So I'm happy to be here as usual. Thank you, thank you, Albert. Now uh, we have Pum Jai from Jeco, and she is working in the background to help us to to make this uh, you know session successful, and. Uh, let Pumjai, you know, present herself and then have some housekeeping stuff, right? Hi, good evening and good morning for, to everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, during the presentation, if you can have any questions, you can write down your question on the question box on your control panel on the sides. And then at the end of the session, uh, Kabir will lead out the questions and ask for the answer for you. And also, you can also download the handout on the handout session, uh, which already attached the file. You can download it uh, as well. And after the session, this session will be recording. And after the session, we will upload on our J4 website. And you can also find in our J4 YouTube channel as well. So enjoy the presentation. Thank you. So I, I will try to switch, right, to presentation mode as well. Yes. My screen. You can share the screen. Sharing, okay, yes. Show main screen. The other screen, okay. Sorry, it's coming. Don't worry, it's coming. Screen two. Can you see the main uh, now? Okay, it's coming. Okay. Yep. So we let the show goes. Okay. Can I get started? Yes. Yes, please, sir. So okay. 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 So as as we just were discussing, you know, the the topic of today is uh, nutrition and practice. Um, so um, nutritionists do the hard work in understanding uh, nutrient requirements of the animals and uh, what ingredients do in the feeds and, and all that in the diets. And they do all the work and then we need to take that and then apply it. And, and that's the application, you know, is in the form of uh, formulation 
uh, but just formulation is part you know, it's just one part of various technical things that um, a, a practical nutritionist uh, is called for to do so he has a program uh, in which uh, I, you can say that formulation is the center of it but there are many other activities around that um, and uh, so we're going to talk about some of those. We don't have enough time to cover everything, but uh, at least some of them, you know, we'll be able to cover on, on what is getting done and how it is done and, and, and so forth. Um, due to a technical issue, I'm not able to run the presentation uh, from my computer. And so uh, Dr. Kabir has volunteered to do, do it from his computer. And this is a PDF, so it's going to be not the high quality uh, that can be expected from a PowerPoint presentation, but we'll try to do the best we can. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kabir, if you could please move to the next one, it would be great. Uh, the one before that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the one. So, basically, the feed business, in its very, very simple terms, is taking, you know, adding value to raw materials. So, you take the raw materials, convert that into a feed, and that feed goes to fish. And that's where the value is, you know, conversion of that raw materials to a feed that is appropriate for the fish that you're feeding. Uh, next one, please. So there are market expectations and who and people who have some experience uh, in the feed industry would know that always, you know, farmers are expecting uh, to have a high quality feed. They want the feed to be having the highest quality, but the price should be the lowest. And uh, so uh, in spite of our efforts to explain them that it is not possible to have the lowest price and give you the highest quality, that's what the market is expecting out of you. So um, you need to come up with strategies, you know, that would address this innate requirement of the, uh, the market. Next slide, please. Um, whereas, Internally, in a, in, a, in a feed company, in a feed organization, if the feed business has to make money, there are two players that are very important. This is one of the early lessons that I learned uh, speaking to one of the, uh, the managing directors of a company. Uh, who, you know, uh, it was a subsidiary of your company, and I had a conversation with him. And um, he was a young managing director called Harold Edwards. And I said, Harold, um, what does that uh, help to uh, in in your business? You know, uh, makes you money. And he said there are two things. One is you know I need to have a buyer, and he should know when to buy what ingredient at what price. You know that is one key criteria. And the other one is I need to have a, a good formulator uh, who knows how to use the raw materials in the products. Uh, this is uh, you know this is obvious because. 80% of the cost of feed is of the raw material. So uh, if you look at the, the cost of the feed, you know, there are several components to it. Uh, definitely um, the, the cost of uh, uh, the, the, there are raw materials and then there is uh, operating cost, you know, uh, manufacturing cost. Uh, there is a selling cost and, and so forth. But 80% of the cost of the feed is, is, comes from raw materials. So it's, it's, it makes sense to have a, a buyer who knows you know how to do his job in a formulator you know how to you know uh, play along with it so uh, so these two people are, are, are very critical uh, in the success in the uh, profit of a, of a feed business uh, next slide please so when you look at uh, the exercise of formulation in feed companies uh, there are two ways you know in which it can be done if you look at a uh, very large uh, feed company, you know, these are large enterprises. You basically see that, you know, there would be a, a, a nutritionist or maybe it's a panel of nutritionists. Uh, uh, and then uh, there will be a whole bunch of formulators. So there will be formulators for every location, you know, those feed companies having uh, multiple feed mills. And for every feed mill, um, you know, there would be a formulator, you know, sitting and, and uh, then working on the command by this nutritionist, um, you know, then he formulates uh, the feed for every day. But in smaller companies, you don't have that, you know, the nutritionist himself uh, could be the formulator 
So you would see this kind of model predominantly these either of these two models, you know, where a nutritionist and formulator or a, a sane person working as a nutritionist formulator, uh, you know, exercising uh, formulation. And uh, we want to look at what the roles of these um, uh, of these people. Yes, please. The next next one. Next slide, please. Um, so we have uh, the the nutritionist. His role is that he designs products based on the species and the life state, the farming system, uh, the method of farming, and uh, yeah, climatic factors, market expectations. Uh, and then he come up with a nutritional and physical specification. So he's going to say the speed is going to have uh, so much of crude protein, so much of uh, uh, digestible amino acids, and uh, these are the fatty acids, you know, whatever it is, you know, phosphorus and, uh, you know, trace minerals and, and all of that. Um, but also he says that, okay, this is the feed that needs to be a crumble uh, less than 0.5 millimeter. This is a crumble more than, uh, you know, uh, between 0.5 and 1 millimeter or a feed, you know, two millimeter or five millimeter or 10 millimeter, whatever it is, um, he defines the nutritional and physical uh, specifications. And this nutritionist approves raw materials um, and, and then develop nutrient matrices and, and models. The nutrient matrices are uh, in, important uh, inside the formulation system to drive the system. So, so you basically say that, okay, if it is a soybean meal, you know, what is the crude protein? And then all the derivatives, you know, what are the different amino acids, what are the uh, digestible amino acids and so forth. And, uh, and then the models, you know, drive that thing, you know, uh, because the crude protein is going to change and then all the derivatives need to change. And so this, uh, this you know, uh, 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 derived in terms of models, you know, which are driven by, by equations and so forth. And he also fixes the upper and lower levels of, uh, levels of inclusion of these raw materials. Uh, based on nutritional and feed processing factors. So the nutritional factors are one thing. So you say that, okay, my, in my feed, I want to have at least so much of marine proteins, at least so much of fish meat. Or um, uh, you say that my feed needs to have so much of wheat flour in order to be able to help my, the, the, the feed processing. Um, so all these uh, are then uh, determined by the, by the nutritionist. And he provides feeding recommendations or, you know, how to use the feed. Um, he drives the R&D and the field technical service teams um, uh, to conduct the trials, report field performance of the feed and, and, and so forth. Now, formulator, on the other hand, he, he is the executor. So he basically uh, takes these matrices that are given by the nutritionist and executes them um uh, they, they they to account for variations in the quality of the raw material so uh, in that sense he's working with the lab the qc that is uh, analyzing the ingredients and then saying that okay today we we received the soybean meal um that's about uh, you know it's supposed to be 46 but we got a 46.8 uh, percent protein in our soybean meal uh, that was received today and uh, and then he factors in the cost and availability of raw material uh, in arriving at the formulas. Um, so, uh, so basically, you know, the stores manager tells him, today we are going to, you know, use a soybean meal that was received 10 days ago, and that soybean meal had, you know, X amount of protein, and there was cost of it. And, uh, uh, and, and it's not just the present cost, but also even in the, in, you know, future cost. So, um, you know, he, he gets this information that uh, um, uh, meat and bone prices are going to increase in in two months so what do we do uh, what do we do with the uh, meat and bone meal in your hand and uh, should you buy uh, or uh, should you hold maybe sometimes you know you even sell your meat and bone meal uh, because it has become more valuable than when you bought it and then you have other alternatives uh, in your store that can replace it so all these decisions you know uh, need to be made by uh, the the uh, the formulator of, of course in consultation with the with the management um, he takes responsibility for gross margin management, which means that the management is telling him uh, the cost of your formula uh, will be so much because it is in relation to the price of the fee. So he takes responsibility for managing it. And, and if there's any problem, then he it goes into a round of consultation. Um, he organizes the audits of the formula 
Uh, this is very, very important because uh, this is something uh, frequently missed by some organizations, uh, auditing of the formula because um, the constraints either for nutrients or for ingredients that are set by a formulator um, is, um, you know, to manage a particular situation. So you are saying that um, I cannot have more than uh, this, this ingredient in this formula because I don't have enough of it in my warehouse. So I'm limiting my, my ingredient, but it's just costing me money. Now, if I don't change that constraint, when my raw material situation gets back up, you know, I'm imposing a cost uh, on, the, uh, on the formula that is unnecessary. So it is very important that an audit of the formula is made, especially with the constraint analysis. So every minimum and maximum that is set in the formula need to be seen question why it is there and can we revise it you know especially those you know that are costing money of course today's modern formulation software um, gives you the options to look at those costs and and, and warn you uh, that you know there are uh, issues you know with this particular uh, setting so you can you can uh, re review the setting revise it if necessary um, and, and of course you know then he advises purchasing on the raw material requirements and prices. So he says that, okay, look, in this current situation, you go ahead and buy corn gluten meal at, at, at this particular price. And if he gives a price and then he says, okay, at that price, you know, this ingredient is not working out, um, negotiate to reduce the price or look for an alternative supplier or maybe look for an alternative ingredient. All these uh, things will be, uh, uh, inputs will be provided by the formulator. So just wanted to, um, uh, Distinguish, you know, what what the formulator does and what the nutritionist does. Next slide, please. So, in doing all this, this nutritionist formulator um, has to have um, expertise in uh, certain areas. One is he has to know the nutrient requirements uh, of the of the species in their life stage, uh, the farming system, farmer objectives. You know, that's very important. Um, it's not just giving um, the you know a, a, a feed uh, blindly to a farmer, but knowing what he wants. Um, does the farmer need a, a, a good growth, a good FCR, or maybe a resistance to disease? You know, what is that the farmer uh, wants to have? And understanding that then would help us to come up with a, a feed that will meet the, the farmer objectives. Um, raw materials in terms of uh, uh, composition, uh, digestibility, minimum and maximum values of these raw materials that can be used. Feed processing technology, because feed processing technology is going to put a limit on what can be and what cannot be used. And again, it's a huge variable, just like uh, raw material um, set up to set up, you know, it would vary even if you look at just pelleting technology, there are many variants within that. Or if you look at uh, uh, extrusion technology, again, you know, there are many variants inside that. So uh, a, a nutritionist or the formulator has to have a very uh, uh, keen understanding of, uh, of uh, feed processing technology. Um, additives, uh, different additives, you know, what they are made of, what they do, how they uh, work, uh, what would be the dosage, ideal dosage, uh, variables in the dosage, and, and how do you arrive at uh, a, a suitable dosage for you. And the safety of these uh, additives are, 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 are important. And uh, finally, going outside of the uh, nutrition area, uh, the nutritionists also need to understand what would be the effect of a diet on the water quality? What would be the effect of a diet on fish health? Uh, what would be the effect of that diet on the fish quality as food? Um, he has to have a good knowledge uh, in that particular area. So these are, I would say, basic minimum areas that um, a, a nutritionist formulator uh, needs to have. Next slide, please. So formulation as an exercise is the process of taking a very highly varying ingredients into a diet which has constant nutrients. So that's what, you know, uh, if you want to summarize formulation uh, in, in, to the, in, a, in, a, in the simplest form, it's taking that highly varying ingredients, converting that into a feed with constant uh, nutrients. So, um, so not only we have several, you know, uh, there are hundreds of ingredients 
so there again, you know, there one level of variability, but also within each ingredient, there will be numerous factors that affect its uh, uh, composition and its quality. So, uh, so it's a lot of different factors are floating around there, and then you need to make sure that the, the formulator makes, you know, makes sure that the diet has um, the the guaranteed levels of nutrients in the feed all the time. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So what are the sources of nutritional vari variation in the, in the ingredients? You have uh, plant origin ingredients, and these plant origin ingredients are going to have uh, the nutrients varying, their quality varying, depending on where they are grown, the climatic factors there, uh, the kind of cultivars that will be being used, <coughs> the processing of the, uh, of the ingredient. Uh, <coughs> uh, you, are, you are extracting the fat, or you are um, pre-processing uh, it into uh, maybe an extruded ingredient. Um, um, uh, there are multiple ways to process an ingredient. So all of this would have an effect on the quality of the ingredient, uh, particularly its uh, nutritional factors. And, and once you store an ingredient, it undergoes changes. Um, it can be subject to molds and, and other things. And uh, those also will have an impact on the uh, on the on the nutritional quality of the of the ingredient, uh, I have one of my clients is in um, is in Saudi Arabia, and something like an extreme climate, you know, whatever you put in there, it keeps you know it starts drying the moment it arrives in the warehouse, and and so you can say you know if I draw a sample today uh, after I receive the raw material, versus in a month later, it's going to be a different uh, composition largely because it's under storage, it has just changed. So, uh, so we need to factor this these, uh, these in, you know, when we are looking at the ingredients. Um, and uh, we have uh, animal origin ingredients, you know, a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, the location of the ingredient, the seasonality of the ingredient, you know, when we say fish meal, uh, fish meal is not the same year round. You know, the, uh, the, the fish uh, undergoes a lot of changes. It, it undergoes maturity. Uh, its diets in the ocean changes, and you know, depending on the season. So, uh, a fish meal's uh, composition, you know, particularly its fatty acid composition, would change with season. So, we need to know what we are getting, you know, uh, when we get something like a fish meal. Uh, the species, of course, you know, uh, you know, again, you know, this is the case of the um, uh, marine uh, protein meals. You know, uh, a sardine is going to be different from an anchovy to, you know, a, a, a tuna byproduct meal. Uh, based on the species, you know, the composition of the fish meal uh, would vary. And uh, if this is from a farm source, dietary history of the animal is uh, it will also going to change. If you have a, a, a chicken, uh, that chicken is raised on a, a diet, you know, which had uh, palm oil uh, as, the, as the main uh, source of fat um, uh, versus uh, soybean oil, uh, which is the another, which is the, the the source of fat? If, if if they are fed on different diets, their fatty acid composition, the fatty acid composition of the poultry byproduct meal is going to be different. It's going to be like the chicken which was fed this given uh, fat. So that, that is going to be a variation there. Um, freshness at the time of processing. This is an extremely important one in the in case of the animal processing. The freshness will make a big difference in the in the quality and uh, uh, the, in the digestibility of the of the raw material. Uh, uh, method of processing, you know, how you cook and, and dry, particularly drying. Uh, if you are drying at a very high temperature, you know, you're going to lose a lot of digestibility. If you dry it at a, a, at a, a lower temperature, then, then it's, uh, you know, digestibility will be high. So we need to understand these, these factors. Again, just like the plant origin raw material, animal uh, uh, origin raw materials also change. Uh, undergo change uh, in storage, you know, particularly with respect to oxidation and, and, and things like that, you know, they, they will undergo uh, changes in, in storage. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just an example, you know, this is the data that I recently got showing, you know, the kind of variability. You think that a corn is a corn, you know, it has a 8.5% protein, but it's not. You know, you look at each of the uh, consignments that are received, and it can be as high as 11% in protein to about 6% in protein. So what, you know, what do we do by assuming that it's a 8.5% uh, 
corn and then you are getting a 6.1 percent protein corn you know your values will be wrong if you assume that they are having a constant value you know uh, or if you say that you know it's 11 percent and you're still using 8.5 percent uh, crude protein then you are giving away protein and uh, so this is the reason why it is important that every batch of raw material that is being received you know needs to be tested uh, for uh, important nutrients next one please so when you look at those nutrients you know there are things that you can fairly easily analyze in a lab uh, you, you a batch of raw material arrives and and if you have an nar within a few minutes you're going to know what is the proximate composition of that uh, ingredient or if you have a wet chemistry uh, if you are depending on a uh, on wet chemistry it probably take half a day maybe uh, three quarters of a day to know you know what would be the proximate composition of the uh, of the raw material but then you know from this there are other derivatives and and then we need to understand that because the moisture it impacts everything so uh, if you make a mistake in in moisture it's going to affect all other values that you'll be using in the formulation. Um, protein is gonna impact amino acids, and, and of course, you know, the digestible amino acids, and it's gonna affect uh, energy. So, uh, and then uh, fat, fatty acids, phospholipids, sterols, energy, all of this will be affected uh, by, by the fat. Uh, any variation in fat would mean that, you know, those other things would also change. Um, when there is a change in the ash content, you know, the macro and micro minerals, you know, would be impacted by it. And also, it, it, you know, ash is a very good indicator of sometimes, um, you know, adulteration and things like that, you know, to see if any sand was added and, and, and things like that. So again, you know, it's, a, it's an indicator of uh, uh, nutrient quality, but also uh, it it's also drives, you know, uh, the other things. So we need to be uh, aware of that, you know, when, when ash level goes up, why? And then if it is purely as a matter of, uh, uh, you know, these components coming from, say, bone, uh, then, you know, your uh, uh, mineral levels, you know, need to be adjusted according to that. Next one, please. So a, a practical formulator, you know, faces this, thing you know you know uh, this milieu where there are no knowns there are known unknowns then there are unknown unknowns so uh, so what do you do when there are no knowns uh, i would say hey perfect you know let's go ahead you know this is a, a good situation to be in uh, there are known unknowns okay so um, we for some species you may not have the amino acid requirements for some species you may not have a vitamin requirement some, for some species you may not have, um, you know, a trace mineral requirement and so forth. So then you say that, okay, I, I'm gonna adapt whatever I know from a related species or, you know, even if there is no related species, maybe even you can look at uh, what is being done in a species like chicken and then, you know, take that value and, and adapt that value. Um, but then there are unknown unknowns, you know, we do not know what we do not know. And, and then at that time, you know, we just have to guess widely and, and then trust your guts. And that's what formulators do on a, on a daily basis is to guess widely and, and trust the guts. Okay, next one, please. So uh, what are the resources available for an aquaculture nutritionist and a formulator to depend on? And uh, so uh, a, a few years ago, somebody asked me to, you know, uh, make a presentation and I looked at this, uh, this, uh, 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 this journal, Aquaculture Nutrition, and I looked at the number of papers, you know, that have been published in a 10 year gap, you know, what was it in 1998, 2008 and 2018. And you can see that the number of papers have gone up. I mean, the nutrition research, um, you know, we see a lot more output, you know, uh, from the aquaculture nutrition uh, uh, in, done in the, in, in the area of aquaculture nutrition, particularly um, uh, from China in the last 10 years, there is a, an explosion of papers, you know, that come from China. So now you have a lot more information that, than what you previously uh, 
had. So, which is a good thing, you know, that you get to know more. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what are the different species that are targeted in public research? So, I, again, you know, when we counted these papers, you know, looked at on what species they were done. And uh, what we realized is that 50% of these published papers are on the top five species. And these five species groups, you know, the carps, tilapia, catfish, shrimp, and salmonids together, they account for more than 70% in volume and value of uh, the global production of these five species, uh, five species groups. And uh, so 50% of the work is coming from that area. And then if you look at the other 50% are about you know, 30 to 40 species that comprise the rest of the fed species. So the, uh, the other, I would say about you know, maybe 20% uh, of, the, of the volume and value come from other species. Uh, but 50% you know, of the work is done on those species. So there is a bit of a dilution uh, in uh, in what you can do because you have so many species to cover and uh, uh, it's also important that we do this work because tomorrow you know these species could become an important species so uh, so uh, so this is the nature of the of the work so sometimes what we would like to see as, as in terms of priority we don't get to see largely because of this diluted effort uh, in in the aquaculture nutrition area next slide please Okay, so then when we look at what are the different areas uh, that are being um, researched upon, uh, you see that uh, you know we have ingredients, <clears throat> we have nutrient requirements and health. Um, I wanted to take enzyme because that's a, a, an area of emerging interest, so we covered enzymes in it, and uh, and then other areas. And and if you see that. A lot of work in the early days was done on, on nutrient requirements, and today it has it has come down. Um, the amount of work that is done on ingredient has gone up, and this is the way it should be. You know that we need a lot more work on ingredients, um, and uh, and also due to the concerns in in the health of the animal, we see more and more work you know uh, done on the health aspect of the animal in relation to their diet. And again, you know, you know, on enzymes, you know, there is uh, more work done than than in the past. Uh, so this this indicates that you know we are we are on the right track in terms of uh, uh, where research is conducted. Next slide. Okay, so today there are a lot of you know not just journal articles, but you know a uh, lot of books. You know, this is right down from my shelf. You know, these are some of the essential books that I have. On my shelf for frequent references, and you can see that we have this NRC uh, 2011, you know, nutrient requirements of fish and shrimp. I think it's it's due for another revision now uh, because the field is, uh, you know, a lot more information gets added now. Um, but then, you know, today we are dependent on the digital resources. We have uh, uh, this database, Amino Acid Database by Evonik. That's a fantastic uh, resource for practical nutritionists and and formulators. Uh, there are also very good online resources you know we have um, data on common feed ingredients you know which is on the uh, feedpedia and we have uh, this database you know which came out as a as a nice little book and uh, i'm very glad that you know they have put that into an online resource now uh, the the intra data on uh, on feed ingredients um, uh, table.com. Uh, there is also this database on nutrient requirements of aquatic species and ingredient composition. Um, this was started as a uh, U.S. soybean uh, board uh, initiative. You know, I think they started when they were American Soybean Association, uh, largely as a Southeast Asian uh, source of data. But uh, it's also a very useful. It's it's still a work under development, and so is uh, aquaculture nutrition as a whole. Um, but uh, it, it focuses on upper feed ingredients uh, specifically because the others are uh, uh, general ingredients and you know, this, these focus on some of the uh, specific upper feed ingredients like for example squid meal you know which will not be commonly covered in other other uh, databases but you would see it uh, covered here um, and uh, and then you know they have changed it a little bit this is uh, uh, this is the latest uh, uh, location at which this database um, is there 
and uh, it's uh, free for all. So, you know, you just need to register and then get access to it. Um, these are very useful online resources that I, you know, find myself, you know, using from time to time. Next slide, please. So we were looking at, you know, these different knowledge resources for the uh, nutritionist and formulator. We have, form, you know, public data, we have uh, owner contract research, we have suppliers, customers, you know, uh, these are also very, very important source of knowledge uh, for, uh, for a formulator and nutritionist. Uh, next slide, please. We already looked at the public data, so we're going to look at the other things. Next slide, please. Okay, so why do we need our own research? And uh, so we are shifting gears from the talking about the practical aspects of formulation to practical aspects of uh, uh, R&D. Um, one is, you know, validation, you know, validating in the real world environment. And, uh, you know, asking, uh, are we going to decide on million tons of an ingredient based on one bag of the ingredient? and uh, which is typically the case you know uh, many times when we do research so we need to keep on validating um, you know what we do um, and also uh, you know the uh, the effect of processing you know a lot of uh, public research on aquaculture nutrition is done on you know fields that are not processed in the industrial way so we need to uh, look at that and 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 farm conditions you know uh, moving from a, um, a tank uh, or an aquarium tank or, you know, a bigger tank, you know, whatever it is, from that tank to the pond, you know, like how does it work? So we need to validate things in the real world. So a lot of uh, time, you know, checking it out in the real world. Um, variability, we talked about the ingredient variability. What is the extent of variability? What is causing it? You know, there's a, it's, an, it, it's an area uh, on its own, you know, requires a lot of resources to understand. Um, uh, interactions, you know, of course, you know, it's not just a single factor, but when you put all these ingredients together, process them into a feed, and then giving to a farmer, you know, gi giving to a multitude of farmers, you know, who are all doing, using the feed for different things, you know, uh, we need to understand the interaction. So there is, there is a, a need for uh, own research in this particular area. And finally, you know, we need uh, new products and applications, product improvements, uh, new product development, and uh, specific applications all of this would not be possible without having an uh, approach uh, for our own uh, uh, research we just cannot fully depend on um, uh, public research you know to get our knowledge we need to have our own efforts to do it next slide please okay so i'm giving you know this is one of my clients and uh, and i'm putting the slide on for uh, different reasons one reason is that you know, uh, uh, this company uh, has given a complete freedom uh, uh, and resources to do uh, research. And sometimes it is a constraint, you know, uh, people look at the cost and they say, no, we don't want to do it. Or maybe, you know, we'll do a limited kind of research and, um, and that's it. But uh, uh, this is a company, you know, so when we started this business about uh, 11 years ago, uh, you know, I, we wanted to put some cages and, you know, uh, we said we'll put a battery of cages in the pond nearby, um, you know, for testing the feeds, you know, uh, we can do a lot of replicated testing um, in, in these cages, you know, which was just outside the factory. Then eventually we went, we, we went to build uh, a, a facility uh, inside and I have some pictures. Next one, please. I think we are a little bit behind, so let me try to, um, uh, you know, speed up things. Um, so basically, you know, for a feed company, the uh, knowledge program should have an ingredient analysis program, you know, which is to require, you know, lab analysis for selected ingredients for detailed nutrients uh, on a on a predetermined frequency. And so this is going to help us to improve our our knowledge of the ingredient. Uh, feed processing. Uh, for testing formula revisions and new products, it's very, very expensive to do it in, a, in the real production environment. So if you have a free feed processing lab, it's going to help you. Uh, a wet lab where you can conduct uh, control trials for assessment of growth, feed intake, and digestibility. You have field data and trials. You know, again, you know, having a systematic approach to collect the information from the field so you can review it. And uh, so where you are observing growth, 
survival of CR and uh, disease resistance from the field. And uh, we want to have contract research. You know, sometimes we want to work with, uh, you know, a, a specific topic cannot be addressed in your own lab. So you just give your work to outside lab and ask them to do that work for you. And uh, can be done with uh, public and private institutions. Today, a lot of good private institutions are coming up for conducting research. So uh, uh, unlike, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, today we have uh, great private labs you know, that can do the lab, uh, that, that can do contract research. And finally, you know, collaborative development with suppliers, customers, and institutions, um, uh, where, you know, there is a synergy uh, between the facilities, researchers, and other resources uh, to reach common goals of interest. So in the following slides, I'm going to give you some examples of how this is done. And, and like I said, you know, like to uh, speed up. And uh, this is the uh, pilot feed plant that we have at the, uh, at the, at the global feed, you know, where you could make uh, 10 kilos of feed if you want per, per hour, or you can make uh, 200 kilos of uh, feed per hour. In contrast with, you know, you take the big equipment, you know, the, the production equipment, the minimum there is five tons per hour. So you cannot do a lot of uh, testing there without, you know, wasting a lot of, awful lot of raw material so having a small setup like this is, is going to be very very helpful the cost of these uh, setups have come down today so it's more affordable today than than ever in the past next slide please uh, this is the global innovation center that we that we built and and basically you know it uh, um, you know we have tanks and um, in, inside this building uh, labs for analysis and, and things like that so the next slide will show you the inside of it next slide please yeah. we have a battery of tanks here these are uh, fiber uh, uh, tanks and uh, basically you now we have what we call as a clear water system this is a complete ras uh, we also have a system in which you know we take the water uh, to the outside and uh, yeah, this is all um, inspired by you know, this work done by the Oceanic Institute where uh, Albert played a major role, um, you know, uh, to use an outdoor pond, you know, where all the processes of, you know, recycling happen and, and also very similar to pond conditions. And then, you know, that is, uh, get, then comes into the tank. So we, we could do the control trial, but the common uh, water source, um, which is also doubles up as a, as a waste treatment uh, place, you know, we have, a a few fish in there in the green water system. We don't feed them, so they basically uh, clean up the, the the system. So it's uh, we have two kinds of system, and the choice of the system depends on the kind of trial that you want to do. If you want to do something where you want to see only the effect of the diet, then you do it in the uh, in the uh, RAS in the clear water system. When you want to see how it would be in a green water system, then you use the other system. So uh, next one, please. And uh, the outdoor system, you saw the cages in the in the pond, and uh, we found that you know the, the shrimp vaname is uh, so tolerant to low salinity that you know the the outdoor pond had only like uh, two ppt salinity, and uh, shrimp was growing great. So we could use uh, the uh, the outdoor cages to grow the shrimp also. Yeah. Next one. But mostly, you know, we grow fish. And uh, in those outdoor cages, you know, uh, species like fungaceous, which are not very, uh, you cannot grow them beyond a certain size in the uh, in the tanks. It's 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 kind of difficult to grow the uh, the fungaceous in tanks, uh, but they grow extremely well in cages, high density, and and uh, they take the feed, fantastic, and they they grow fast. And and we could do well replicated trials using fungaceous uh, in those cages. Yeah. Next one, please. Okay, so sometimes you know these these all these systems are helpful. But recently, about a couple of years ago, we uh, embarked on this new venture where we wanted to develop uh, the farming system as well as feeds for snakehead. Um, so you take the snakehead and put it into the cages. Um, within a few weeks, you know they somehow you know make a hole in the cages and then they <laughs> escape. You know they don't like to be in the cages. So you cannot use a cage system to test these uh, these fish. And so you have to do it in the pond. And fortunately, the company was, you know, willing to do that. So we we actually did the work in the in the ponds. And the next slide uh, would show you a, a picture of the pond. You know, these these fish. You know, if you wean them right, you know, they become uh, they can take 
take the feed uh, quite easily. So, uh, so you can give them a floating feed and, and, and they can consume the feed. Uh, then I have uh, the next slide uh, was supposed to be a slide, you know, was supposed to be a video. I was gonna show you that. Unfortunately, because of this uh, technical difficulty that we have today, I'm not able to show you the video. Um, you know, where you see the fish jumping out of the water to grab the feed. You know, this is first generation, uh, not even domesticated. This is uh, wild, wild brood stock and then spawned and raised. And uh, so uh, has not even gone through the, the, the domestication uh, in this particular uh, case, you know. And now we have uh, done the, the breeding and all of that. But uh, at the time, you know, these particular fish were not uh, uh, domesticated, but still, you know, they, they go out and aggressively consume the feed. Um, so sometimes, you know, a, a lab setup is not going to work. You know, you have to go to the pond and, and do the work. That's the point I, I would like to draw. Next one, please. Okay, so I, we talked about the institutional collaboration. Um, India may be known as a tropical country, you know, with its hot weather and, and stuff, but in the mountains, we have rainbow trout. And, uh, and which is growing. And, uh, you know, today, um, you know, our original um, strains, I think they were, they were taken from California. They, uh, they went to the UK and the British took them to India and struck them in the, in the mountainous lakes and reservoirs. Um, but today, you know, there is a resurgence in, uh, in that and people are now bringing eyed eggs from Europe, um, uh, from, from Denmark. Uh, to to grow the fish in in India. So um, so the the directorate of uh, cold water fisheries research is an institution that specializes uh, in this, and they have a bunch of young nutritionists, you know, uh, uh, who are working on this. And and then you know they they have the fish, and we have the 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 uh, the feeds. And so we decided to put the uh, the two together and work on a uh, on, on the development of high performance feeds for trout in India. So this is an example in which, you know, you join forces, um, you take the synergies of, of both the parties, you know, to, uh, to develop, uh, you know, uh, specific solutions for the, for the market requirements. Next one, please. Okay, in addition to that, you know, we also work with, uh, like I said, you know, work with uh, suppliers and customers. And, and basically, you know, um, as uh, anyone in the, in the feed industry knows, there are many, many products that are being offered to improve the health of the animal. And, uh, and then, you know, so uh, we wanted to develop a, a functional feed for shrimp uh, a few years ago. And uh, there was no way we could do this trial in our lab because we don't have a system in which we can induce and challenge uh, diseases. Uh, of pathogens and the animals. So uh, the only way we could do it is in the in the field, you know, where farmers are facing problems every day. So we created this uh, uh, different variants with, you know, working with our suppliers to get the products, you know, working with them to know what would be the good dosage and, you know, what what are the previous work, you know, in this particular uh, with this particular ingredient. Uh, whether it is promising and then you know then selecting the ingredients that can go into the feed and then we did the field test you know we made um, uh, you know about uh, 10 farms per uh, ingredient per feed and we also included some placebo uh, feeds as control and then we sent out and then we tracked the health uh, of these farms so uh, our technician would go in there and then look at the health of the uh, animal uh, how the culture is progressing and so forth so farms that had high um, uh, problems, you know, white gut or high feces, um, and, and also uh, high risk areas for uh, WSSV, we did that. So then, you know, looking at the data, we, see, we saw very clearly that uh, the animals respond to certain uh, ingredients, but not to others. And for example, uh, all of our placebo boy feeds, you know, we had, I think like 20 farms, you know, there was no improvement when they, when they have got hit by uh, uh, the white feces. So we know that, you know, what product worked, what didn't. And then based on that, you know, we put together this uh, product called Nutribio 15. So uh, for managing disease problems in the field. The next slide, please. Yeah, so, you know, this is, this is what our uh, technicians would observe and they would take a picture uh, on their mobile phone and all send it across, you know, to report uh, things that, uh, you know, uh, on a, on a real-time basis. 
Um, uh, next slide, please. And we, we, I've noticed that it, it crosses over, you know, now we are in the process of developing a, a novel feed. Uh, this is under, under R&D. We are not commercially um, started selling the product, but we included, uh, you know, many of the principles that we learned from the go feed to this novel feeds. And then we did a trial comparing uh, established feeds in, in the, on the, on the novel side. Uh, so we had a, a commercial benchmark one and two. And, and we found that, you know, at the end of it, you know, we found that the, the PL survival was a far higher, you know, this is only from PL 1 to 14, you know, not involving the earlier stages, but just uh, they were on a common feed till then. And then we switched them over to uh, this different feeds at PL 1 to 14. Uh, uh, we just did better than what we expected, you know, a very high level of survival uh, when these principles are included. So we know that, you know, these are transferable. Next slide, please. So, you know, we are nearing the, the, uh, the conclusion. So uh, the product development, you know, is dependent on, you know, what is publicly available, you know, in terms of published literature and you know, reviews and so forth, um, combined with private and in-house research um, and added to collaborative work, then, you know, these are great tools in, in making sure that, you know, we are able to develop a product. Next slide, please. So uh, just as a conclusion, you know, I would like to uh, summarize. Um, so there are diverse areas of uh, knowledge that is required for effective formulation of aqua feed. The uh, most critical one is the knowledge of ingredients. This is, I, you can, <laughs> I can say that this is my personal opinion is that um, the knowledge of the ingredients is the most important one because it's, uh, one is it's acutely short, Secondly, uh, the one that I talked to you earlier, 80% of the cost is from the ingredients. So, um, so uh, purchasing them at the right time and right price and utilizing the ingredients uh, optimally, uh, using a, a good formulation system uh, determines the profitability of any feed enterprise. Um, creating and refining ingredient uh, nutrient species matrices and equations or uh, key to de deploying ingredient knowledge and formulation programs. Otherwise, you know, it's all in, you know, out there in our minds, but how do you take it and, and keep on looking at your, in, you know, uh, matrix for an ingredient and see if the values are right, you know, and looking at your equations, see if those equations are expressing things right. And then uh, re reviewing, refining based on the data that we get is, is extremely important uh, in, in capturing the knowledge of the ingredient. Into the, uh, into the formulation program. Um, there is a wealth of public information for building an ingredient database. Like I said, you know, there are public databases available, but if you want to build your own database, then you know, there is a lot of information available out there. Um, and, and you can supplement that with your own program where you have, a, uh, like I said, a routine analysis, a frequent and routine analysis of uh, commonly used ingredients for, you know, like for most of the known nutrients that are, can be analyzed in the lab. If you could do that, you could do some digestibility in your lab and, you know, again, you know, integrate that data, you would have an outstanding uh, ingredient knowledge program. Um, and collaboratively work with suppliers and customers. Uh, here, no one has all the answers, but the more of the pieces you collect, you will solve the, the puzzle sooner. So, uh, so we need to trust our suppliers. Uh, we need to be open and uh, be willing to work with the customers. Sometimes, you know, it requires you to make certain compromises and things like that, but uh, ultimately it will be very, very rewarding when you do that. Next slide, please. Uh, it's about the uh, R&D requirement for, for product development, not just for new product development, but also for improving your products and uh, developing specific applications. Um, I would very highly recommend having an in-house R&D program and uh, because you have immediate access to live animals, and then you can test and retest. Um, so when I work with the supplier, sometimes they, they come in uh, or disappointed, you know, when I say that their product does not work. Um, and I tell them, look, you know, one test doesn't mean everything, you know, we can, uh, we can test and retest, you know, um, uh, to see how it works. And then I, I also say, you know, when I ask you for a sample, you send me one kilo of your sample. Now I'm making a decision on your ingredient based on this one kg. It, it's not fair. 
and uh, uh, but when you have your own facility you know then you have the luxury of doing it you know that when you believe in something you can test and retest things um, so so I would highly recommend that uh, seed manufacturers consider and even ingredient suppliers should also consider an in-house uh, R&D for the same reason um, universities and research institutions can be valuable resources for, uh, for R&D uh, but then the chance of that a single institution is going to meet all your requirements is going to be very very uh, remote uh, even including yourself I mean our own R&D is going to give all the answers you know so we have to go out and similarly we need to recognize that you know whatever famous university is not going to have all the answers for you so you need to know like who's doing what in a, in a good manner to be able to coordinate and, um, uh, and, and, and get the work done in the right place. And uh, maybe a project can be broken down into pieces and then you know, given to different places to get done. Um, and, and finally, um, uh, we need expertise and infrastructure capabilities, not just in nutrition and feed, but also in critical areas, related critical areas. Uh, health, water quality is important, environment is important we need to have uh, capabilities you know to to do that also um, so um, so those are my take-home points today so that you know brings us to the end of this presentation thank you thank you so much uh, dr shuresh uh, on the presentation and i will ask dr albert take and uh, join us for the q and a session I will try to stop sharing and then go back to our discussion. We have some interesting questions uh, today from, I think, first one from Dr. Waldemar Rossi Jr. from Kentucky State University. And the question is on uh, mycotoxin, right? How is the industry dealing with mycotoxins and to what extent mycotoxins have impacted the feed industry in your view? Uh, we can go with Albert first or Dr. Suresh first. You can choose either of you. Yeah, I think uh, let me let me give it a shot first. And, uh, I, I, my assessment is that uh, the mycotoxins are taken more seriously by the livestock feed industry uh, it's it's extremely i mean they take very very keen uh, interest on uh, on mycotoxins and, and their control um, by uh, the poultry swine and um, and dairy uh, or cattle uh, ruminant uh, feed industries taken more seriously than aquaculture uh, feed ingredients largely because i think uh, one is, you know, we do not know to a full extent, you know, the, the impact of uh, mycotoxin. Secondly, the high variability. Um, we see that uh, species to species, it uh, differs the susceptibility to uh, to mycotoxins. Um, and we don't see a great deal of evidence also in, in uh, you know, the, the effect of mycotoxins. It happens occasionally in certain very sensitive species like maybe trout. Um, you know, you you would see that happening, but uh, things like uh, fungus, for example, you know, uh, the studies show that they have a very high tolerance for aflatoxins, an unbelievable high level of um, tolerance for aflatoxins. So um, I don't think we are taking that seriously, and I think we should. You know, that's uh, that's what I think. Albert, Albert. Um, no, I mean, I th I think we should take them seriously. I mean, they are. There are over 500 different mycotoxins that we know, of which the aflatoxins are one of the ones which are, you know, which are highly toxic. The thing is that most of our ingredients, especially our plant ingredients and also many of our animal ingredients, are contaminated with mycotoxins. Most of the mycotoxins have an effect, have a negative effect on the immune system of all species. They also have effect on gut structure and and uh, permeability. Some mycotoxins actually affect the tight junction in the intestine and then and then the toxins from the bacteria can go straight through. And so I think we have to be very careful. Um, but like you say, it's not on a radar screen 
of most nutritionists at the moment because really there is not much information out there that's been done and and if you know and so but it really is you know and especially those ingredients that we ship from one part of the world to the other part of the world i mean the mycotoxins like victor was saying you know that with storage things happen and one of the things is are, are the increase in, in mycotoxins and and if we think about things like using sweepings or or dust from the processing facility, these things um, are very, very important. So I think mycotoxin is an area that's uh, that we sh that needs a lot more attention and especially by the researchers. Also, the weather storage conditions can affect the mycotoxin level in raw material as well as in in the in the in the bag, the feed bag. Next, next we can if you look at the history of uh, fish feeding and nutrition, right? 70s we are using trash fish, you know, or uh, poultry offals and st 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 straight to the pond, and then coming to 1980s, 85, uh, it was a farm-made aqua feed around 85, 90. Uh, we started making some feed. Uh, on farm, and then it was kind of a uh, Peter Edwards, right? Uh, making compost of the kind of it's like feed was like supplemental, right? At that at the time, and 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 then if you, if you look at the history of of, of uh, feed manufacturers, right? 1982, Tongwe started right with a, the owner started with a with a uh, what do you call a uh, semolina machine, right? A semolina yeah, machine. Yeah. Yeah. And then going to bring bring to the farmer ponds and then making feeds and that's how it started 1982 1983, uh, and then as uh, Dr. Suresh discussed in his presentation, right, 2010 we work on raw materials, ingredients, uh, nutrient requirements we are doing since uh, 2019-90s. What would be the next, right? We are in 20, 2020. Uh, what would be the next, right? We need we I think we we are, we are at a crossroad in terms of um, aquaculture nutrition, right? We have been uh, doing raw materials, ingredients, requirements. What would be the next, right? We, we can talk. I, can, I, I, will, I, will, I will throw this question so to both of you. This is, a, this is a very, very broad question, you know. Uh, yeah. right. you, what we, you look at the publications, right? You, you've saw those, those graphs. You see the trend. I'm just yeah. trying to focus on those trends, right? What, where we are going or where we should be going well i mean i, I think uh, where, where we would like to see going at least uh, you know we see a lot of work on say for example nutrigenomics and i would like to see you know real application information coming out of those approaches uh, we have been speaking about them for the last 10 years and now i would like to see uh, they producing data that is usable um, so probably you know something that combines uh, bioinformatics uh, where we look at uh, the effect of uh, either ingredients or nutrients on the performance of the animal. Uh, can we uh, check the performance of an animal uh, within a short period of time, not waiting for uh, eight weeks or you know a 16-week trial? Uh, can we get information you know within you know? A week of feeding, maybe you know, uh, two weeks of feeding, something like that. Can we get information? Um, I, I think you know that is where you know I, I, I'm seeing that you know the possibilities of uh, you know which which would also be very very helpful for us you know to have um, quick feedback so you know we can make our decisions. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you know even uh, to the point I you know we could we could have them um, and. Uh, rather than you know through lab analysis in vi in vitro assessments you know uh, maybe you could combine in vivo assessments and uh, and these tools you know so and uh, incoming ingredient can be analyzed I mean this is just dreaming but uh, I'm saying uh, if that's possible you know that would be great and uh, but but one area is uh, where we're going to see uh, important work to be done is how diet affects the quality of fish as a human food. Uh, that I really see that you know as having a great promise, and I'm I already seeing uh, you know some uh, initiatives on that side. Uh, how do we uh, you know uh, impact the flavor of the uh, of the fish or uh, the nutrient content of the uh, fish? 
you know, based on the dots that we provide, how do we optimize it for, for, for markets? You know, this, uh, um, you know, this is already being done uh, to some extent, but it's uh, going to be an area where a lot more effort, uh, you know, uh, needs to be uh, sent. And I, I see that even on the private side, uh, people are taking interest in it and, and, and going in that direction. Albert? Uh, no, I I agree, especially with the, with the last point, where we basically you know can tailor the the nutrient profile of the fish to the consumer. Like right. we have eggs and milk with DHA added, we can also do the same you know with with our right. farm species. And like you say, we have a good story to tell. But I think the future on feeds depends very much on the farming system. If it's a flock-based system, then we have to start doing our R&D, like Victor showed. You know, he has a clean water system, but also he has a green water system which he can apply to a pond system. But if we're going to have a flock system, you know, we we also need to have a part of our R&D has to has to also change. But also we have the move in many countries for indoor for RAS system. You know, and and so in the end, the thing about aquaculture is like agriculture. It's it, we can have urban, we can have you know. There's so many different types of culture systems, but we have to tailor our nutrition and feed research to to a particular farming system and to a particular density. I mean, as I said, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a farmer that has the last say you know and and what victor showed the importance of is the importance for feed companies to invest money into r d to do work today for tomorrow but at the end of the day it's it's the performance of the feed on the farm and the cost per kilo of production that in the end will di dictate whether one farmer buys from one company or the other and so a smart farmer is a is a farmer that also does not buy just 90, you know, 100% on one feed company. You know, a smart farmer will have a certain number of ponds or tanks where they could test, you know, new feeds, new new customers, you know, just because always we have to innovate, always we have to try and try and we have to, you know, reduce the costs. If, 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 so if I summarize the uh, your, your responses, it, both of yours, it's like uh, first one is basically uh, we need a shorter period to test. So it, uh, in, when uh, Dr. Shu was, was uh, talking about this, I was thinking about could 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 like gene expression, looking at the gene expression, particular type of feeding and gene expression at, at particular life stage could be a quick uh, indicator of what is happening. If we know what specific right. gene to look at, right? Uh, yeah. And then tailor, tailor made feed looking at the table, uh, looking at the consumers. Uh, a specific feed, as well as uh, targeting a specific farming system, could be bioflock, a special feed for bioflock, targeting uh, feed for RAS, right? It's a lot of companies are trying to develop RAS feed as well, right? Another yes. question to this is, uh, I think it, it was in my mind. We are using a lot of chemicals in pond today, right? Could we have because this is causing a lot of problems in environment. And also consumer health. If if you think, could we have feed based solutions? I think I think we can. It's just a price because the consumer looking for cheaper feed, but they are spending a lot of money, a lot of money on farm, right? Uh, for chemicals and edit and additives and even I mean in Vietnam amino acid minerals. Could we have this solution and train or educate our farmers that this is a little bit expensive? But at the end, it is cheaper solution. Both of you. No, I know, but it's not. Actually, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Albert. No, no. I mean, what I'm getting at is not just farmers. You know, Victor talked about. You know, we have our different plant-based ingredients, and also we we use, we have our animal ingredients for both sectors. They use chemicals by the buckets. Whether it's herbicides, pesticides, uh, antibiotics, many different things, and so we also. You know, it's not just the aquaculture sector that, yes, on farm, we have to be careful what we use. But also many of the ingredients already come with a lot of baggage and we have to be careful, you know, how we select them and how we use maybe solvents to get rid of those contaminants. 
Dr. Suresh. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with that. I mean, we have come a long way, uh, first of all. And uh, if you look at, uh, you know, for example, you know, India is the second largest uh, uh, producer of aquaculture, uh, you know, products. I mean, mainly, mainly fish. Um, and we didn't even have formulated manufactured feed for the fish uh, about, you know, 12, 13 years ago. And uh, um, and that you know just converting them from using the raw materials um, as such you know uh, to uh, a manufactured feed itself made a big difference in terms of water quality um, because now your FCR is uh, is very very low because of that you know very little uh, waste being produced the ponds are cleaner so you don't have to use you know many of the additives that you would. we lost uh we, we lost uh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you can you hear me now yeah. yes go ahead okay so um so issues like that you know that uh, affected um, um our uh, environment you know is improved today because of the um improvements in um uh, uh, in, the, in, in just you know converting from a mash feed to a, a, a manufactured feed. Okay, so, we have, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So we have seven more minutes. We'll take a, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Albert, Albert was gonna say something. Go ahead. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, a, a good example is a country like Vietnam, you know, cause at the end of the day, you know, for the farmer, the biggest cost is feed. And so in Vietnam, for example, the government sets rules and guidelines on how you manufacture feeds, but also on the nutrient levels and also on the contaminant levels as well. It's it's really, you know, a good example. Um, but it's one approach. Other countries, I know Victor could probably talk about it, but, you know, other countries have a different approach. And the problem is that, that you know, that because aqu still in, in Asia, which is 90% of the production, aquaculture is still very much small scale as opposed to other parts of the world and so the the difficulty is there is that you have many small scale farmers that use chemicals that maybe they shouldn't you know and in the end this affects the whole industry you know so we have to be careful so the issue is 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 very important but at the end of the day it's up to the government to legislate that but it's like some countries do some countries don't Anyway, sorry, that was my. Absolutely, we need a larger. Point. We have uh, one 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 question from our audience, Mohammed Afuzia, about. This is a generic question, but you can answer or you can answer generally. What is the best feed formulation software? So you, you can recommend if you want, but if you don't know, no, I don't think you want to recommend any any specific software. But I don't use like this. I don't use any software. I use Excel, a linear program based. Excel sheet. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I think Excel comes with the optimizer. Uh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit clunky. You know, uh, you know, when you want to do it, uh, when you want to have your answers in a minute, you know, it's kind of difficult to <laughs> follow that approach. Um, uh, commercial. I mean, there are uh, many wonderful uh, enterprise level packages. Um, so it's all a, a matter of a personal preference, and uh, I have used all the the big ones. And I currently use Alex, uh, which I like uh, very much uh, because it's very well integrated with uh, Windows. So it's all it's all a matter of you know your personal preference and and how um, you know what what you like the best. But you know you can go for best mix, you know. Uh, uh, any of those uh, enterprise packages and one of the good things about it is that uh, previously these packages used to be very expensive uh, they were out of reach for anyone except you know a large enterprise uh, today you know they have pricing schemes that allow them to be used even at a, at an individual level uh, they are a lot more affordable today than they were in the past and uh, one caution that I would uh, say is um, Sometimes, you know, some people come up with uh, software uh, with good intentions and, you know, all that. But 
if they don't put enough effort to keep them updated, they will go out of business very fast. And then if you invest in uh, one of them, when I say invest, you know, it's not just the money, but more the time that you invest in a software, because then you need to come up with this your matrices, you need to input them and, and all that. You get them invested in, you know, your time is invested in it. And then if they go out of business, then you will be in trouble. So uh, it's best to stick with the more established players uh, because you know that they're going to be there, you know, and uh, uh, that's my only advice. Albert? Uh, my only comment is, I mean, I have four major clients. Each client uses a different software. But my main point I always say is that the data is only as good as what you put into that database. And so at the end of the day, like Victor said, I mean, it's what's really important that people don't understand is that every batch is different. You know, you have to really do your NEARS or whatever it is, but and formulate accordingly. And I also, um, also add to that because even not, not only the ingredient in composition, right? And the more information we have on a specific ingredient, amino acids, minerals, vitamins, fatty acids, toxin levels, the better you said, like your last sentence was puzzle, right? So the more we mm -hmm. have, more pieces we have, so more quicker we can, quicker we can solve the puzzle. Absolutely. Right. So I think it's the last question from audience, Muhammad Ashraf Malik about the enzyme. What is the practical role of exogenous enzymes in aqua feed? Okay, this is kind of my topic, but I will let you answer. <laughs> uh, Albert, do you want to go first? Or? Okay, no, I mean, just if we follow the, the lead of the poultry sector and other sectors, for sure enzymes is part of the future in that, you know, if it's not digestible by, by the particular species that we're growing, we can, we can either add enzymes to the diet to help the diet, to improve its digestibilities, or we can actually add enzymes to the ingredient and ferment it, for example, to improve its digestibility. With aquaculture, the problem is how we apply it. You know, and so if you have a, a facility where you can top dress your feed with heat sensitive ingredients, then, you know, we have a, a good way, you know, but it's just because enzymes are proteins and most proteins are denatured by the some of the temperatures that we use during conventional pelleting or extrusion. So I really think it's part of the future um, in terms of environment and in, in terms of improving the digestibility of the ingredients we use. Yeah, Dr. Suresh, we have two minutes. Uh, I mean, the application of enzymes is, is proven in livestock, you know, uh, in aquaculture. The challenge, you know, Albert outlined it, you know, being uh, heat stable means that the granular enzymes, you know, uh, do not work in the feed uh, largely because they'll be lost, you know, by the time it's uh, pelleted or extruded. Uh, so top coating with liquid enzymes is the way to go. And, uh, uh, but, but the technology in doing that, you know, is, is pretty complex and, and also there is a high cost, you know, when you want to put a, a, a top coating system. Um, the investment levels are high and uh, but then you know we need to work out you know uh, we need to determine if that also works out you know there is another issue is the water um, the, the solubility in the water you know so if you top dress it and then put it into the water is it going to stay on the feed or going to be lost to the environment that's also something that needs to be done and uh, you know and I'm, I'm working on that area I don't have definite answers hopefully you know uh, you know, within my third quarter, you know, I can get an answer. You know, that's what I do. <laughs> There's always a trade-off, right? Top coating, we, we may lose some enzymes in, in, in the water, but also when you put in the mixer or then we lose some enzymes, but there's a possibility the enzyme can act during the manufacturing process. Yeah. In some of the uh, protein profile or there are some studies, published studies on that, or, or even in case of phytase, there's a phosphorus availability increases more mm -hmm. than uh, post pelleting. So there are no, no trade-offs for both, mm -hmm. but a lot more works need to be done in terms of application and use and type of enzymes as well. Yeah. Yes, Albert, we have. That's why, that's why what we need is that we need a presentation on the enzyme, Kabir. <laughs> okay. For somebody to explain it and. We'll have that. 
But final question is about attractant. A lot of lot of uh, queries about attractant, and farmers like to smell the fish meal. But but what about the species? What about the animals, right? And and uh, I, I'm referring to one of your paper, and I think it was a Global Aquaculture Advocate that uh, published long time ago. You tested in shrimp. But what is your general comment, Dr. Suresh, about the uh, types of attractant can be used for animals, not for the farmers, okay? For animals. Mm. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I think, you know, we, we did some work, you know, uh, while I was in Brunei and it got published in, in aquaculture, I think, um, you know, where we were looking at it. And then what we found as a common denominator among the ingredients that have an effect on the animal is the, uh, uh, the the low molecular weight peptides, you know, uh, peptides that are, you know, below uh, a thousand daltons, you know, one kilo dalton, um, they are very very good attractants. So uh, I, I would say that you know that is one primary criteria. So when you look at all these ingredients and then um, you know look at the that peptide site, that can be a very good predictor of you know what can be a uh, a, a, a good attractant and uh, um, so um, we looked at different factors like soluble protein and you know uh, different things but this this was one keen uh, uh, thing that we saw you know anything that has uh, whether it's a krill meal or squid meal you know we saw that uh, happening so that's it taken all right <laughs> no, I mean, at the practical level, hydrolysates, obviously, hydrolysates are beautiful to, to supply that. They also have a, an acid effect, um, you know, which has another different effect on the gut microbiome. But like Victor said, you know, you have, as an attractant, they work very well. Um, and then the other part is that you also have different types of hydrolysates, you know, and, and krill, again, is, is a good example. and and it has many soluble amino acids there as well that really work as, as feeding attractants. Specific amino acids can also help, which is available in your fish solubles. Uh, There's one question from uh, Dr. Zuri de Marican, as you know, about least cost formulation for shrimp based on as amino acid requirements. Can we do least cost formulation for shrimp based on amino acid requirements? Why not? We do I mean, that's how we do it. I mean, that's how we do it, you know. Uh, but really, uh, the, the formulas are driven by um, uh, lysine and methionine, I mean, sulfur amino acids. Um, and sometimes, you know, pre on end. But normally, you know, when these two requirements are met, then everything else falls in place. So, mm -hmm. so the focus is really on this. So it's really simple. You don't have to. Um, I mean, may, maybe uh, uh, Zuruda's question was related to maybe an ideal protein concept or something like that. But uh, but formulating, you know, doing a list cost formulation based on um, amino, digestible amino acids is, is what is being done. Uh, why? Albert? No, I'd agree. I mean, most large feed companies already do that. The small companies don't. They do it on a total amino acid basis because there's very little published information out there that they can use. But okay. but the large companies are already doing this. So the last, I think the last question, it is a question, comments, or a, a, a true irony, what is the industry is facing now. We don't need to, I think, discuss, we don't have much time. We have already passed 10 minutes, but actually five minutes, I would say. It was like a, from Mr. Olu, Olu Rahman, Faisal, I think. So nutrition or science gone very far, but farmer is farmers are not getting the price. Do, the do, price? You mean did you say the price? Right. Farm, farmers are not getting the price of the of their product. Farm gate price is low, right? But we we have done a lot of nutrition studies. Hmm. Uh, don't you think it is a very concern, like high concern, should be high concern for us because what are you doing hmm. for? No, okay. This is so. So the question, if I understand it right, is asking. Uh, there's so much of knowledge available, but uh, the 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 prices of the feeds are higher than they should be. Is that is that yeah. the question? Farmers getting the getting the uh, getting their profit right. There's zero profit, or they're farming at at a loss in some cases. 
I, sure. this is going to be this is going to be very very geographic specific. Uh, it, it's maybe you know uh, in some countries you know the uh, feed industry, aqua feed industry, is early stages of development uh, that you see you know a, a trend like that. But then uh, once you know the capacity is established, I feel that very quickly that capacity uh, expands. You know, in other words, you know. Many people jump into the uh, into the business and then they they start offering the feed and uh, and quickly you know um, uh, the the level of competition that exists doesn't allow for um, pricing the product very high and you know uh, extremely high I, I would say and uh, so so that question could be uh, you know probably related to the geography from which the person who's asking the question is coming from. Uh, but I don't see that uh, being the case. I mean, um, you see that uh, cost of ingredients have uh, increased. Mm -hmm. and to, to some extent, you know, you also, the lack of knowledge, you know, sometimes uh, is, uh, is, you know, causing a higher price than it should be because we simply do not know. So we, we want to be on the safer side, uh, maybe um, sort of provide uh, certain nutrients that are probably not necessary for the farming system. And, uh, but that all would happen in the early stages of development and eventually, you know, it should be all coming to, you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a level at which, you know, you, you simply cannot price the product, you know, beyond a certain level, uh, otherwise you would be out of the market. I, I, I will let Albert close, but I will just be after my opinion about that. So farmers, I think farmers are not stupid, like some farmers, they adjust and adapt themselves to the situation, they can switch a species. They can uh, find a different way of market their product. Maybe like they can go to live fish market. I saw one farmer in Malaysia. He was selling his fish to uh, hospitals, getting a better price, right? So uh, tilapia farmer. So the farmers can adapt, and who who the farmers who cannot adapt will die off eventually, right? And we will see the consolidation of the market. Albert, the last question that closes. But may may have one point just before yeah. that. Before Albert, yeah. yes. Um, uh, my advice to the feed manufacturers is to provide um, choices for the farmers. Um, in, in other words, you know, you provide a feed, you know, a high performing feed, which is ob obviously going to be expensive, but also provide them a cheaper uh, alternative, you know, maybe two or three choices, you know, that they can choose from. And uh, these obviously would be differing in terms of the quality of the feed and the price of the feed and the performance of the feed also. And but I've, I've typically seen that, you know, uh, so when you look at it, the farmer is going to spend the same amount of money to produce the per kg of feed, uh, sorry, a per kg of fish, you know, right. he's going to spend, spend the money, same, same amount of money because you're, you're using a cheaper product, which gives a higher FCR. So if you look at, you know, how much I've spent on a per kg of feed per, per fish, it's, it's all the same. So, but then invariably what I see is, these premium feeds are chosen only by 20% of the farmers. You know, 80% of them, you know, go for uh, cheaper. They have their own reason, but uh, but I feel that uh, no matter what, the the feed company has to give the farmer to choose from. They have to give them uh, the the choice. That's also, that's that's sort of the numbers, right? Education and the numbers. You use this feed, your FCR will be this. You so, have this yeah. At the end, so the education is also important. Albert, closing. Yeah. We have. Sorry. No, I mean. At the end of the day, we are here to serve the farmer. If the farmer fails, we sell no feed. So obviously we have to, you know, a good feed company will have different types of feeds depending on, on the farming system or the, the money in the farmer's pocket. But the problem for us in Asia is, is that we do have to import our ingredients mainly. And the prices, especially now during COVID, we have to pay in dollars to buy them. And so the prices are incre increasing. But this is not only for aquaculture, it's also for poultry, for hogs and other species. The smart companies are like the ones that, that, that Victor is working with that have their own R &D. innovation, R&D, where they can do today's work for tomorrow. But mm -hmm. also we have to do this, the farmers have to do the same. It's not just that we buy a feed and we use it. Good, a good farmer, will also have part of his or her farm where they do R&D with different types of feeds, with different types of feed management, 
with different types of probiotics. You understand, it's like um, not only feed companies, but also farmers, we have to try and reduce our costs per kilo of production. So it works both ways. So thank you, thank you so much. I will ask Mumjai to come if he's around, but thank you, Dr. Suresh, for uh, your time and uh, support with the, I think, uh, to bring the audience. I think we had uh, quite a good number from all continents normally we have from all over the world, audiences. And uh, thank you, Albert, as well. Thank you, our audience, and the good questions. And questions coming uh, keep coming, and I think uh, we, we would continue the interaction. And thank you, Pumjai, for all the support in the back. Thank you. And sorry for the uh, glitches at the beginning. Uh, we try to set ourselves up properly, but yes, but we will always be better and wait, wait for the next year, uh, in the new year. Happy new year to all uh, from Akota Nutrition Network, as well as from Japan Nutrition in Canada. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Pumjai. And thank you, audiences. Thank you, all the questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Yeah.